A very good afternoon to all of you. I think uh, all of you are enjoying the live stream lectures from the beginning of the day today. We have an interesting uh, and a very common topic of school. Very good afternoon to all of you. I think uh, all of you are enjoying the live stream lectures from the beginning of the day today. We have an interesting uh, and a very common topic. Uh, sorry for the interruption. So we have an eminent speaker, Dr. Minakshi Iyas from Shankarnetra Le Chennai. Uh, we popularly call her MS Ma'am. Uh, she's been my teacher, a wonderful person and a wonderful teacher. She needs no introduction. She's a very eminent pediatric ophthalmologist and a squint specialist at Shankarnetra Le Chennai. Uh, she's been trained in University of Iowa under Dr. Scott and Dr. Keach. Ma'am. Uh, is a go-to person for DNDs and fellows at Shankar Netra Le Chennai. She's been the director of uh, she's been the director for medical education and uh, B at Shankar Netra Le Chennai. Uh, Ma'am has several peer-reviewed publications both at national and international level. Uh, Ma'am is an excellent and a meticulous person and a meticulous surgeon as well. Uh, we welcome you, Ma'am. Uh, the screen is all yours. Lovely. Thank you so much, uh, Saumya, for that uh, very warm uh, welcome and introduction. And I thank uh, the Shankara family for uh, inviting me to uh, celebrate the World Sight Day along with you. Intermittent exotropia something that we see very, very often. And uh, here are some tips that I'm going to share with you in the next uh, about 15, 20 minutes, tips to make your life easy. Now, this is uh, going to be a very practical lecture, and it's basically for any general ophthalmologist uh, or a starting out pediatric ophthalmologist, postgraduate, who is managing intermittent uh, exotropia patients. So this was a young boy. Some, he came sometime last year. Uh, his name was Danush, and he came from Royapuram. And mother said, uh, you know, uh, I'm seeing Danush's eyes are deviating all the time. I'm seeing them very, very often, uh, etc. Then Danush, uh, you know, is sitting in my uh, waiting room and in the chair and I'm not finding any deviation. He's looking at me and saying, hello, madam, good morning. And I'm not seeing anything. And then I gave him the Snellen chart and said, Danush, can you read? And then, aha, I can see very clearly a really large deviation. So the first tip is... When you manage a child of intermittent exotropia or, or, the, or the parent complains that the eyes are deviating, ask child to look at a distance target. Or sometimes you can just walk out into the hallway and sneak a peek while the child is waiting outside because they're usually kind of daydreaming or looking at uh, a, a television in the waiting hall. And you can spot that uh, deviation very, very easily. So look at this uh, young man. He too came and said, you know, my eye is deviating. But if you look carefully in the top photograph, there is definitely some narrowing of the palpebral fissure in the left eye and some abduction limitation when you uh, in the left eye also in the bottom photograph. So really the tip number two is that not all exotropia is intermittent exotropia. You have to carefully check for incompetence and presence of abnormal head posture, any narrowing of the palpebral fissure because you may be dealing with something like a Duane's retraction syndrome. Also check for sensory causes. It may be a sensory exotropia, like patient may have a cataract or something in the retina. So really, what is this intermittent exotropia? It's a large phoria that is intermittently controlled by fusional convergence. So during the phoric phase of intermittent XD, the eyes are perfectly aligned and the patient has actually excellent fusion and stereoacuity. So imagine you, are, you may be managing a patient who actually has good stereoacuity. So you have to be even more cautious. So we're going to look, let us look at a seven-year-old girl from Hosur. She came a few weeks after this boy. The parent notices the left eye deviating off and on for about three months. So it started apparently after an episode of fever and it uh, was seen when the patient is tired or daydreaming and really there were no visual complaints. So here again, she was looking at me and I really didn't see much deviation. But then I asked her to look at a distance target, and then 
I could again immediately see the left eye deviating and quite a large deviation. So what is important? A very good history is very, very important. So you have to talk about whether there was any prematurity in the child, developmental delay, because these kids don't may also have intermittent XD, but they don't do that great with surgery, especially the kids with developmental delay. You want to know whether there was any viral illness or vaccination, anything that might have uh, made a good, well-controlled intermittent XD decompensate. Also, you want to know if there's any family history. Some kids tend to close one eye under bright light. Kids with intermittent XD, that's called diplophotophobia. And that may also be reported by the parent. Any variability, you have to ask, is it worse in the evening? Is there diurnal variation? Uh, for example, look at, uh, this is my tip number three, because you watch out for mimics. Not all intermittent exotropia is intermittent exotropia only. For example, look at this kid. She also has a lid drooping and this whole thing happens in the evening and she on investigating turned out to have ocular myasthenia. So follow, look at the uh, mimics. Tip number four, you have to follow the stereopsis very closely. Now these to the left are all the near stereo tests. I'm sure you're familiar with them, the titmus fly, the rand dot, the TNO. The one to the right is a distant stereopsis measurement. And so the stereopsis, if it's worsening, you know that the control of the exotropia is also worsening. But the near stereopsis can remain good for a very long time while the distant stereopsis is worsening. I know, I can hear some of you asking me, you know what, I don't have distant stereopsis. What am I gonna do? And that's my tip number five. If binocular acuity is worse, you make the patient read the Snellen with both eyes open, and then you also check the vision individually. You find the binocular acuity is worse than the monocular acuity. That means the patient is trying to control the deviation even at distance by consistently accommodating and hence becoming myopic. Because when you accommodate, you converge, but you also become myopic. And so both eyes open vision is going to be less. Step number six, meticulously document the motor control and try to use a score, a scoring system. There are many scoring systems. And what do I mean by that? So here is one that we commonly use, and this is called the revised Newcastle score. Because while you are monitoring the sensory test, you want to know whether this child is able to control the deviation, motorically control the deviation. So this consists of three uh, uh, you know, aspects to the score. As you can say, there is a home control, there is a near control and a distance control. And if you quickly run through that, you can say home control is scored from zero to three, depending on the frequency of how often it is seen at home. And then near control, depending on how easy it is to break the child's alignment and the same for distance. So let's do some scoring here. So this little boy I told you about, the mother said she saw it, um, you know, uh, less than 50% uh, of the time at home. And then when you see him in the clinic in the near you just can hardly ever break the fusion. But when he looks at distance, after multiple covers, he'll look like this, as I already shared with you. So we go back and look at the score. And so glancing at the score, so that would probably make him a, a, a one or a two plus maybe a zero, because you remember, he just could not break him at near. And then after multiple covers, then he remained manifest. So I'm going to call him the two plus zero plus two, which is a four. And similarly for this girl, this, they were seeing it more than 50% of the time. In the clinic at near, she was pretty good, but at distance again, you know, she manifested spontaneously. And if you look at the score again, she would be most likely uh, a one plus a one plus a three, which is makes her a five. This is very important to score because how else do you know if the patient's control is deteriorating? only if you monitor with a carefully uh, calculated score. Now, tip number seven, how are we going to manage these patients? You've made the diagnosis, brilliant. Refractive management is the first step. Full myopic correction, full astigmatic correction. But I can hear some of you asking, but what about hypermetropia? Because if I gave hypermetropia, then the convergence accommodation will all relax and the exotropia can get worse. Well, not always. So when the hypermetropia is very small and you do not correct it, then it can add as a minus lens therapy. Correct. So the control can improve. But if you have large amounts of hypermetropia, more than three diopters, 
the alignment may actually improve because now you have provided good vision. So larger amounts of hypermetropia, you should prescribe. Small amounts, you can leave alone. The next important tip before you do anything, treat amblyopia. If there is a strong preference or, or clear amblyopia, occlusion is the way forward, and that is traditional occlusion. What about alternate occlusion? It has been tried by several uh, authors, and, and it's an effort to improve the control, reduce suppression. Efficacy is debatable. Some have shown good results, and uh, Dr. Kushner is one of the people who have shown good results. So yes, I also give a trial of alternate occlusion. The, the next uh, tip is really conservative management. Does that really work in intermittent exotropia? Not really. Yes, the first step is refractive management and amblyopia treatment, but all the other conservative management like fusion exercises and prisms, they don't really work. Uh, prisms, especially the patients will keep eating up the prisms. Very small, tiny deviations. If the patient is asthenopic, you may try uh, prisms. There are several vision therapy references in the optometric literature, but not that popular as yet in management of intermittent exotropia. So tip 10, what about minus lens therapy? Can you give minus lenses? Yes, you can give it a try. Younger preschool patient with IDS, uh, usually the deviation is very small. You can give two to four diopters and uh, it may stimulate accommodation and convergence and that is how it works. You have to discontinue when the children start school or develops asthenopia or develops esotropia. You have to discontinue. So in India, it means if you diagnose the child at about two, two and a half, maybe for six or eight months, you can put the child in a minus lens therapy. Look at this kid here. All I did was give, him, give her over minus of minus two and her eyes are much, much better aligned. Next tip, number 10, be truthful with the parents because they, they're all going to ask you, what is happening? Uh, what, what will happen to this deviation? Will it get worse? Will my child need surgery? Tell them, honestly, studies are very variable, but the vast majority do progress. 75% of untreated patients do progress. Tip 11, know when to operate. There are many, many indications in literature, typically poor control of intermittent XT, deterioration of control, severe asthenopia, visual confusion and diplopia, or cosmetically, it's a bothersome. Sometimes people will come and tell you when they're in the jobs where it needs to, uh, dealing with customers, they'll come and tell you, you know what, the customer is asking me, where are you looking? Are you looking off to the side? Who are you looking at? So, you, what, so we talked about poor control. What is the definition? And of course, you remember, we talked about near and distant stereopsis, if that is deteriorating, and your Newcastle score shows Motor control is deteriorating, that is poor control. So motor control is the key. So how easy is it to break the fusion in the clinic and the more frequent episodes of drift, slower recovery of the drift, a good history from the parents may actually clarify what is happening the rest of the time. And these days parents will come to you with a, a mobile phone video recording of what the child's alignment looks like at home. Tip number 12, no need to rush. What I mean by that? Because early surgery is good, maybe better results, but reoperation, risk of amblyopia, and loss of fusion is greater in the younger patients. Later surgery, a rare spontaneous improvement may happen. And also you can observe the patient closely for control and deterioration and then decide. So you don't have to rush. If you see a two and a half, three year old, you don't have to immediately take the patient up for surgery. You can wait and watch and measure and document that is deterioration of motor control and then take the patient up for surgery. But the, but the best outcomes were seen when the patients were surgically aligned before seven years of age. And you did not let the strabismus go on and on and on for many years. And when the deviation was still kind of intermittent, these patients did better. So don't delay endlessly, but don't rush into surgery either. Okay. Surgery is fine, but what surgery? What am I going to operate? What is my choice? If a clearly dominant eye is present, recess resect may be a better procedure. And as you all know, that a basic deviation is where the near and deep distance are the same. True divergence excess distance is much more than the near. Pseudo divergence excess, well, it appears as if distance is more than near, but once you occlude for 45 minutes, they become equal. After occluding for 45 minutes, still the distance deviation is much more than the near, then look for high AC by A ratio. 
and it may be high AC bio ratio that is keeping the near deviations very, very small. So this is Kushner's classification of intermittent exotropia. I've only put it here, even though it's a long uh, list here, to just to tell you that the 37% of patients were basic and another 40% of patients actually were the ones you will uncover by the 45 minute occlusion. So the vast majority of patients, you will be able to diagnose with very simple maneuvers, uh, taking the distance angle and the near angle and seeing whether they're equal or one is more than the other and whether the fusion, breaking of the fusion will change that. So, all right, unilateral surgery, or, that is a recess resect procedure or a bilateral lateral rectus recession, which is better. People have tried unilateral single muzzle recessions with really small deviations. I have not found them to work really that well. True divergence excess distance more than near will do better with bilateral lateral rectus recession. Basic deviations did do slightly better with a recess and resect on the more deviating eye. Now, here's an example, young fellow. Um, he, he has come with uh, intermittent exotropia, good control at near, bad distance control was like this. Parents very keen on surgery. What do you see here? What you see here is that the deviation appears to be much larger in up gaze than in down gaze. So what are we talking for? Talking about, we are talking about looking for patterns. And if you look at this child in side gazes, you can see the inferior oblique of the, uh, of the adducting eye is overacting at least plus three. So his pattern is a V pattern, and that is because of bilateral inferior oblique overaction. And this child had inferior oblique weakening procedure and bilateral lateral rectus recession with good alignment. Here's one more. This child did not have a pattern. Only bilateral lateral rectus recessions were done. He again, good alignment. So really, where do you want the patient to be postoperatively? A small ESO deviation is what we try for, but really studies say, you know, that has no relationship, but you be very carefully manage the ESO deviations in the early postoperative period, tiny ESO deviation. They usually have better long-term success. And sometimes you will have to operate only on the deviated eye in basic deviations like this lady here, good postoperative outcome, but the palpebral fissure is slightly narrowed and in the left eye. And that is what you will counsel the patient before surgery. This boy did not want any palpebral fissure narrowing. So he underwent bilateral surgeries and he again has very good outcome. So I want to thank Team Shankara for making me a part of the World Side Day celebrations. And I hope these tips have been useful to you audience. I am immensely thankful and very proud of Dr. Kaushik Murli and Dr. Soumya Murthy. Both are our alumni of a pediatric ophthalmology department of Shankar Netralia and doing wonderful work. So proud of you and thank you so very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for that excellent lecture. Uh, it's always, always a pleasure to hear you. Concise things in ways that we wouldn't have think it could be concised into. Those tips covered almost everything in IXT, which one could think of. In just 20 minutes with 15 tips, you've covered 14, sorry. You've covered almost everything in IXT. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for being uh, a part of this. Ma'am, we have a few questions. Yes. Uh, there's a question which says that most clinics don't have an access to distance stereopsis. Is there something surrogate that could be used? Yes. So as I had indicated in the lecture, uh, one uh, simple trick that you can uh, look at is uh, to see whether when you measure the vision binocularly with both eyes open, if that is worse by a line or more than uniocular measurements, it usually suggests that the child or the adult or whoever is trying to keep the distance angle less by accommodating and converging. converging. When they accommodate and converge, then they may become a little myopic. And they will do this only with both eyes open. So when the both eyes open vision is a little less than unilocular vision, that just gives you a clue. But equally important is the motor control. So it, stereopsis measurement is only one aspect. And as you, Soumya, very well know, a lot of us go by how easy is it to break the patient? How quickly does the patient recover alignment? Do they stay broken? Do they stay tropic? 
these are some things we use. We also use what the parents say as how often they see the deviation at home. Uh, so motor control is a very, very important aspect that we resort to look at and follow closely uh, to take decisions. Sure, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, is there any age that you would consider ideal for operating on these children? Uh, so I mentioned I, I, it in your talk, but right, right. So as I had mentioned, and uh, you know very well, very young kids who so at loose cutoff is about four years of age, uh, but very young kids we are a little reluctant. Uh, for a, a couple of reasons. Uh, most of these uh, surgeries require operating for distance deviation. And many of our clinics are not equipped very well with a target at six meters uh, to assess the distance deviation. Because uh, imagine a child who is two and a half, three years old, child is not going to look at a distance deviation target. They're interested in you, in your toy. What is there? They're, they're looking at your prism. They're trying to take, the, you know, mess with the things around them. So if you don't get an accurate distance deviation, no point in operating. The second thing is if the patient becomes even small amount of esotropia early on after surgery, then they have a risk of starting to suppress the eye that it will become esotropic. Remember intermittent XD, if they have potential for fusion, they're already fusing at near. So you don't want to take a child who's fusing and then make them esotropic and then they start suppressing one eye. They become a monofixator. So loosely speaking, sometimes after four, sometimes after four, but again, I want to impress if the control is deteriorating, you intervene. Perfect, ma'am. There's another question again. Uh... What's your uh, procedure of choice in a case of convergence insufficiency type of exotropias? Right. Convergence insufficiency type of exotropia, as you know, is quite a bit rare. Uh, so what I... and. Uh, you usually see it in slightly older patients, patients who would present to you in the late teens, early uh, 20s, uh, you know, typically in our Indian scenario, before they get married, they want to have their, uh, you know, correction for cosmesis. And uh, these patients, you can still do a recess resect. We may have to do more resection than recession. Uh, that is lesser, lessen the amount of lateral rectus recession, increase the amount of resection. If their distance deviation is really, really very, very small or not non-existent and is only there for near, then you obviously would resect the medial recti of both eyes. Again, it's very rare situation. I have ne never done even one. Have done many where the near deviation is more than distance, but both were quite significant. In those cases, yes, usually do a slightly more resection of medial and a little less, lesser of recession of lateral. Okay, ma'am. Uh, this... More questions coming up. Sure. Uh, what would be your uh, plan of management in an IXT patient uh, with high AC by A ratio? Right. So that's a tricky one. So uh, as you know, if you have uncovered a high AC by A ratio, your first thing you're going to do is to talk to the parent and tell them that the child may very well need post-operative glasses, bifocals. Because uh, till the AC by A ratio kind of, uh, you know, goes down with age, very often you will end up doing, uh, giving the child glasses because high AC by ratio, if you, you have, remember, you, even if a child has high AC by ratio, you have to operate for distance angle. So it's going to make the child, uh, you know, even more for near and then need a bifocal or a progressive lens post-operatively. I do not have any experience. Theoretically, yes, you can put a Faden on the medial, and uh, posterior fixation sutures, or you can do a Scott's procedure on the medial recti to prevent this from happening. But I don't have any personal experience. I have had perhaps in 20 years, two patients who have had high AC by ratio and have had a large uh, ESO shift post-operatively. And these were managed with bifocals and eventually we were able to wean them. But most important is for you to counsel the parent uh, beforehand so they are not in for a, a bit of a shock. Perfect, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, do you suggest using a Randolph stereopsis uh, at distance and use that as a distance stereopsis? That's again a question asked by somebody. You mean you take a Randolph and go stand in the distance? RDS uh, as a surrogate. Can we try that out? No, 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 no. 
No, no, no. You uh, see, the, some of these, uh, uh, what do you call it? Some of these devices, like the BVAT, which used to be there, do come in with a built-in distance stereopsis measurement for which you need the Polaroid glasses to measure. Uh, but you cannot uh, use the Randot, which is designed for near and uh, use it for distance. I, I won't say you cannot. I only can say I can't imagine how you can. Um, and perhaps the person who's asking this question can try and uh, publish something. If it can be used and validated to follow, uh, to be a measure of distance stereopsis, even at three meters, and if that can be correlated with control, uh, that would be a wonderful guide for us, uh, for all of us as clinicians. But I would not uh, recommend that is based on what, whatever I know. Yeah, okay, ma'am. Uh, we move on to some more questions, ma'am. Uh, Patients with IXT usually come as adults and they may have good recovery. Should we recommend surgery straight away or start other correction options first? What's your take on it? Uh, it's okay. So to, uh, patients who are adults who come with intermittent exotropia will come with a few complaints. One, number one is cosmesis. Uh, number two, they'll come because they have asthenopia and headache. Sometimes they will also talk about they're not able, they're, uh, they lose their place when they are reading, especially if they are free, freely alternating. And so for any of these, I don't see any merit in waiting. So if you have a patient, and remember the patient is very tense and in your clinic, they will appear like they're in very good control and they're immediately trying to refixate, et cetera. That's when it's important to ask them to show their group photographs, not selfies, selfies are up close ask them to show a group photograph where they're standing along with friends and you will see that XT is constant. It's not what you see in the clinic. So that will give you a clue that these, this, the other, other stuff is not going to work. What, what else is there? If the, if the patient, the adult is not at all wearing anything properly, is not wearing a proper correction, yeah, at the most you can give that. But really nothing else was, is going to work at this uh, in the scenario. So usually you will have to intervene. I don't see the merit in waiting. Okay. Uh, there's a question from Dr. Amar who asked you, what's your experience in the finding the A and B patterns in patients with IXT? Percentage of IXT uh, patients who would have pattern deviations. Right. Uh, I won't be able to say out, out of the top of my head. I have not looked at my data. Uh, but I would say, I would like, I would like to only say that it is not, it is not insignificant. In other words, it is something that you should look for in every patient. And sometimes the clue is, uh, is this, uh, even children whose intermittent XT is variably controlled and not very well controlled, if they have a pattern, they will adopt a head posture. So if you have a child who's intermittent XT walking around with a chin down, you know, don't think the child is not looking through the glasses and uh, peeking on top of the glass. It may very well be that the child has an A pattern. And similarly is true for the V pattern, which is even more common. So I approach a patient of intermittent XT, presuming that they have a pattern and always look for a pattern. So I, I did not uh, have time to touch upon things more in more detail, but there is always a checklist for intermittent XT. As I, I had already said, um, you make sure patient is wearing the correct refractive correction, amblyopia has been adequately treated. But the next few important things is distance near disparity, Look for a pattern and uh, an AHP that is along the abnormal head posture along with the pattern. Look for lateral incompetence. This is kind of your checklist that you have to look for in every case. So I'm not sure I'm of my uh, data, but you made me curious, doctor, and I will go look at my data and hopefully share it with you the next time. There's a question from by Dr. Rajesh who wants to know what will be your procedure of choice if you have a pattern but there is no inferior oblique or a superior oblique overactions or underactions. How uh, would you deal with it? Would you do a slanted recession or would you do a transposition? A transposition. I have no experience with slanted recessions. So I would always uh, transpose, uh, you know, half tendon width or even three fourths tendon width if required. And sometimes you, are, you do what you were trained to do. And in my training in my fellowship was, we did only uh, transpositions that is off shift, uh, off, uh, vertical offset for pattern. And that is what I would uh, do. 
Perfect. Uh, now there's a question from Dr. Srinivas. You mentioned about palpebral fissure changes during surgery, post surgery R and R. Is there any way or is there any tip? How would you manage or how would you deal with this palpebral fissure changes? Uh, actually, I don't know. We looked at it uh, prospectively, and uh, the the change is significant, and it really seems to depend on the amount of uh, recession resection. So if you do more resection, there is definitely a, a narrowing. I have we have I haven't looked at resection versus plication to see whether plication has less uh, narrowing. Only thing I do is this: uh, a, I counsel the parent uh, or the patient. B, sometimes I will look at the palpebral fissure, and if the vision is equal, sometimes choose the eye that has the larger palpebral fissure, even if it's the other eye that is deviating. I will explain to the parent why I'm doing this, and I will choose the eye that has the larger palpable fissure. Sometimes I also look at what refractive correction they are wearing, and if they are wearing a myopic refractive correction, you know the, that eye is going to look even smaller after the, uh, you know, after the surgery. So then you would perhaps choose the other eye. So these are small things that you kind of play around with, but how to avoid narrowing of PF. Not sure. What you may know, what you could, one other thing, uh, Rajesh, uh, sometimes uh, people are reluctant to go to a third muscle. That is, either they will go on trying to do lateral rectus recessions larger and larger, or sometimes try to do large RNRs in one eye. That sometimes is also a culprit. So if you have to do in a large angle exotropia, bilateral lateral rectus recessions and one medial, then you can make all the uh, surgeries that you're doing not very large. You know what I mean? And that way you can prevent uh, a palpable fission narrowing. So what I mean is split, split your surgeries up and don't do huge amounts of surgeries on one eye. That is really the setup for problems. I hope I've answered your question. Yeah, there's another question from uh, Nishita who asked a uh, question like a patient in a presbyopic age with an IXT and a moderate control should we defer giving breast biopic glasses? Does it have any role on worsening of the IXT? Uh, potentially it can, uh, theoretically it can, but I don't think you should deprive the patient of good vision, uh, especially today when everybody is on, uh, uh, you know, it's not print reading anymore. It's everything is uh, digital reading. So it will cause a, a considerable eye strain. I presume the person who's asking is not presbyopic. I can tell you, if you withdraw, <laughs> if you do not give presbyopic glasses to a presbyopic when they need it, they'll be miserable. So you give it and then deal with the consequence of the intentionality if it does happen. At the most, what happens is if they have in a four, there are four year at near, and uh, you know, then they're in, they're not much deviation at distance. They only have small four years. Sometimes you can manage them with orthoptic therapy if they do start becoming symptomatic. But don't deprive people who need uh, near vision correction. Uh, this question by Dr. Nivedita, how would you go about treating uh, residual IXT? Um, okay, there are just so many factors. Uh, if it's a very, very small uh, residual deviation, I know uh, very uh, some of us, we do give a small amounts of prism if it is bothering the patient and, uh, and the parent, and it will bring them within the fusional range. Uh, if it is significant residual deviation, uh, depending on whether you have maxed out on the original surgery. If you have maxed out on the lateral rectus recessions, then you may want to move to medial recti uh, resection or plication. If you have done only a moderate amount of recess, resect, then you can re-recess resect that eye if it is an amblyopic eye. If you have maxed out on one eye, you can always go to the other eye and do a recess resect on the other eye. So usually these are the scenarios. There are always a lot of other, uh, you know, unless you know patient details, I won't be able to give you more uh, things, but broadly this, uh, these are the principles of how you manage uh, residual. One of uh, your student, Dr. Anushree is asking, what's your opinion about single LR recession, single muscle recession for small angle deviations? Right, I mentioned it also in my talk. So. Theoretically, you're able, supposed to be able to correct up to 20 prisms of exotropia with a single large lateral rectus recession. Uh, I, my personal experience has been about two cases and I wasn't uh, very happy. Uh, it did not, uh, there was still a residual primary deviation. My concern is again, 
will it uh, create incompetence because you're re really weakening one lateral rectus, you know, and in a young kid, they'll very quickly start turning their face to avoid that gaze. So you may trade one problem for another. So typically I have given up doing single muscle lateral rectus recession. If you have to treat 20 XT, do a small, really small recess resect or do small bilaterals. Um, uh, this will be the last question. This is from PSTM. He's asking if you have a child with moderate control and moderate stereops and good stereopsis for distance, would you plan surgery? Moderate control, uh, no. Good moderate stereops. control and good stereopsis, de you know, definitely no. You would you would wait and watch. Um, Again, you know, if, when you, it's not just control. Remember, you also have to go by symptoms. You mm -hmm. want to see if the child is asthenopic, uh, if the child is uh, showing any diplophotophobia for the parent. Uh, if the parent is talking about, uh, you know, they see the deviation. I give what is called the deviation diary, which means I tell the parent weekly once, one day, all you're going to do is watch your child's eye. See how many times it's deviating, put a line, bring the diary when you come. So you may want to look at that also, because what you are seeing here in the clinic is a fleeting few minutes of interaction where the child is alert and, you know, afraid and everything is in good control. You may see something very different in the real world. So why strictly moderate control, you know, control and good stereopsis, maybe wait and watch, but you have to find out if other stuff is also going on to take that decision. Uh, the last question for the day. What is your, uh, this is from Nikita, wants to know the role of active vision exercises or active vision therapy in a case of IXT. I was hoping you won't ask this because I don't want to offend my optometry colleagues. So I don't really give uh, uh, optometric vision therapy for uh, intermittent exotropia. I can only imagine if the angles are small, but the patient is symptomatic, then perhaps it makes sense to put them through orthoptic therapy. You know what I mean? So you're, the patient is symptomatic. They seem to have, be having some asthenopia, but your angles you find are really small. It's more a phoria going into a, a intermittent XT, that stage. Uh, and the patient is adult enough and will understand uh, orthoptic therapy. Then maybe it's worthwhile exploring that. But for most others, I really can't imagine how it will help when you have a deviation of 30, 40 XT, uh, which the, you're trying great effort to control. I can't imagine how the orthoptic therapy will work. So small deviations that and the patient is symptomatic, both. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for, uh, for your lecture, for all the tips that you have given us. And it was wonderful hearing you again. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, so from you again and thank, again. You so thank you, ma'am. Thank you for thank you. Thank for you so much. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.